everyone, or good afternoon now. Had a good break. All right, so uh, um, we've uh, talked about, uh, you know, Uri introduced us to uh, the concept of API-led connectivity, why it's important, how it's uh, going to help uh, your enterprise uh, take its game to the next level through becoming a composable enterprise. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked about this notion of experience APIs, process APIs, system APIs, and some of the principles, the architectural principles uh, that you would uh, want to follow to kind of get to that sort of end uh, sort of uh, state. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had a couple of uh, great uh, presentations from Arsenal and Siemens about sort of how the, they, their businesses are, are getting transformed and then how they're using connectivity to, as, a, as, a, as a strategy to help uh, uh, enable this transformation. And so what I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, we've, so we've just, uh, you know, I, I wanted to talk to you about the journey to get there. And so, you know, the business model transformation that all of you and your companies are experiencing uh, are coming from a, from a variety of industry forces, right? So what, what you're going through today, if you're in the uh, insurance industry, it's about how do I uh, keep my customer close? How do I, uh, you know, de-minimize all, minimize all the risks associated to my business? Um, how do I make sure that the way we're uh, operating is in a way that's prudent for the customer, but prudent for making sure that we're also managing the risk in, in my company through innovative ways, right? So that's, if you're an insurance company, that's what you're thinking about. If you're in financial services, it's all about the digital bank. It's all about how do I cater to this new mode of customer, inter customer interactivity, B2B customer, B2C customer. It's about being able to digitally provide a new muscle so that you can serve your customers, as well as making sure you're secure, you're managing your risk and your compliance and all that good stuff, right? And payments is a huge thing with banks as well. How do you make sure that you're able to keep up with the new payment mechanisms that are out there? If you're in the retail industry or consumer packaged goods, it's about the omni-channel. It's about new sort of ways of understanding how consumers can be served through a much more contextual way. How are we going to be able to serve a consumer by knowing what they've done, what they've purchased, and how they're going to now behave? It's all about getting closer to the consumer and making sure that they're loyal to your brand, making sure that there's an innovation layer in your own company to make sure you're keeping up with that sort of uh, fickleness that a consumer has nowadays. If you're in healthcare, it's all about redefining how you're going to now manage this new customer and doctor, nurse, provider relationship. How as a hospital or as a provider are you going to redefine your operations to make sure you're ready for this new kind of landscape? And what kind of ecosystem partners are you now going to have? So, so this is very key. If you're in the media industry, it's all about, you know what, it's the digitization of content, not only around dissemination of content, but aggregation of content. So how are you going to now receive content and give content in a way that is much more contextual, in a way that is much more customer-centric, but also how are you going to make sure that you're continuing to make money and staying relevant by offering innovative kind of platforms for you and your advertisers to coexist well? In the energy industry, it's all about, you know what, customer centricity. It's all about, you know, it's smart grids, smart meters. We already heard about that a little bit. It's all around connected customers. It's around the redefinition of new standards that are, that are emerging that are now going to redefine how you work. Things around clean emissions, things around localized energy production, things like that. So in all these industries, and forgive me if I missed some other industries we're in, but you know, what we're seeing in the, in the customer base that we have is you know, business transformation is a very key element that we're trying to enable, the outcomes that we're trying to enable, and these are some of the outcomes that we're seeing. So we have a bunch of industry forces, but what, what I really want to focus on today is talking about how do you get there. So, you know, the operating model that needs to transform is key. It's all about technology, absolutely, but it's also about the processes that you have to imbibe. It's the people, the, oops, okay, that's my boundary. So it's about the people, it's around people and process. It's around how you operate, how you actually literally go and do business. So let's talk about that for a second, right? And, and how do you actually paint this picture? Well, let's start from what Uri, Uri mentioned in the beginning. So fundamental kind of uh, problem that we're solving is, from a technical perspective, is we're exposing assets, um, digital assets, to different audiences, right? And so Uri talked about this notion of APIs, different ways to go about APIs. Great. Now, what does this mean in terms of how you now operate? It's very interesting, right? Because on the very top spectrum, you'll have 
rapid, agile practices, people that are building mobile apps, people that are working on two-week, you know, agile scrum timelines. But at the very lowest end of the stack, it's still very legacy, very monolithic in nature, very much around, you know, centric, uh, you know, change management centric, release management processes, ITIL, ITSM centric processes, right? So how many of you have, you know, all these big processes in your, in your company? Just raise your hand. Pretty much 99% of the audience, right? It's except for that one person in a startup. So, so this is the key, is how do you m manage this emerging spectrum that's, that's coming up? And so it really is an emerging spectrum, because what's happening is that there is no definitive kind of layer that you can say, we're gonna operate in, in this spectrum like this, and we're gonna operate in this spectrum like this. It really is a spectrum, a smorgasbord, of a mix of practices, a mix of cultural transformation. And so the key in my mind is, well, how do you actually start to qualify and quantify what this, this, this spectrum looks like? What this, um, you know, the folks that are at the very top, how they're how they're operating, you know, how do you actually qualify that and quantify that, and then how do you compare that to the folks that are at the very bottom? And so I wanted to just give you a, a very quick framework, things that we're seeing in some of the leading customers that MuleSoft works with, that we're seeing as ways to kind of latch onto some, some definitive drivers and definitive kind of quantifiable um, uh, ways for you to look at this, right? So one is looking at agile and lean practices, DevOps, platforms, infrastructure platforms, the way looking at teams and culture, and the way looking at governance, right? So I just wanted to take you through a little journey, a little step-by-step -step journey of each one of these facets. So the first thing, agile and lean practices. So, so this is a very obvious thing. A lot of people that have read, you know, Lean Enterprise or books like that, it's all about, you know, being very quick. And, and so what we see is that in, in the top, top layers of the spectrum, we'll see a lot of agile practices, a lot of continuous integration, continuous deployment practices, especially in the edges where there's you know, aggressive mobile app development or very aggressive timelines that need to be met. But of course, we still have the other world. That's not going away anytime soon of you know, traditional waterfall-like practices and the governance procedures around that. And so the key is, hmm, how do you kind of differentiate between both of those, right? And how do you kind of understand how to cooperate in those two worlds? Because you're moving from a world on the left-hand side in some cases, where now you had requirements kind of over a, you know, and, and, and definition of a project over a six month, nine month timeline. And how do you actually now move to a model where you're actually saying, you know what, the requirements are not gonna be in a 90 page uh, BRD. They're actually gonna be in a one single sentence. As a role, I want to do this so that I can get that. That is a requirement in, in terms of like behavioral driven design. And so how do you actually move to that sort of a requirement model and how do you actually now chop it up so that you're actually pushing the production very regularly? And that's part of the key part of agile development and agile practices is, you know, you're using behavioral dri driven development and, and test driven design principles in addition to continuous integration, continuous deployment to kind of inform how you quickly go to market with, with, with products in a very agile manner. And key to this is making sure you're thinking in terms of product. You're thinking in terms of everything you're doing is product, is, is, is a product with a consumer, a product with a market. Is this thing gonna be relevant? Is this thing gonna have a consumer? Am I making it with a consumer in mind? But let's not forget where we came from, right? This is actually happening. This is still happening and it's gonna happen. We still have these kinds of initiatives. So raise your hand if, if, if this is sort of what's happening in your enterprise. You have a good, good amount of you, right? But, you know, raise your hand if this is what's happening in your enterprise as well. Yeah, exactly, so, so there is a mix. There is no one size fits all. There's a spectrum of things emerging where you're actually gonna have a little bit of everything across the spectrum. And so the key is, you know, some questions to ask yourself is, well, first of all, where are agile practices kind of, you know, being employed and how can I actually figure out areas of opportunity to actually make sure we're innovating at scale really quickly or innovating really quickly in certain business units for certain initiatives? And what are the roadblocks for us to get there? because you know what, it's all about making sure you're taking a customer-centric mindset and treating things as products. And then you know what, how do we bridge between this slower world and this faster world? What does that look like in terms of a process? You know, the change management processes, the, the ITIL, ITSM-centric release management processes and all that kind of stuff that are here, how do we kind of blend that and make sure it works well with the agile landscape over here? And so some of these considerations should not be overlooked. These are key questions to ask 
yourselves as you go about becoming an API-led connected enterprise. Second thing is this, DevOps. So DevOps is, is a very interesting one that's emerging in many, many different uh, enterprises and pockets. And so when we say DevOps, you know, what do we mean, right? I'm gonna define a few things. So first of all, we, what we see, what we see in, in general is this ability to kind of procure your stack in real time very quickly. So it's this notion of, you know what, before you used to have this traditional uh, request tickets you had to put in, and not, not you used to have, you still have, request tickets for infrastructure versus more of a real-time procurement of infrastructure, right? So let's look at it this way. What does a developer do? A developer makes software. But before they do that, they need to kind of make sure they provision the environment and also deploy and ship that to production, right? So here's the thing. Who, who, who's familiar with this story? Developer asks for a VM, and they get a message saying, yep, please fill out this form. Uh, so kind of frustrating, especially if you're a developer that has an initiative that, that, that needs to be completed in two or three weeks. So how many of you in your enterprises see this situation or grappling with this situation? A lot of you. So of course, this, 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 this has led to this notion of developers getting really frustrated. So I made a very highly scientific graph here, joking not, where you know you have a, the y-axis being developer frustration, where you can see the developers really frustrated and, and really sad in areas where they have to go and fill out this traditional request and request ticket process, right? But they're pretty happy when they're actually writing code. And so what is the goal of, of what we see enterprises trying to do is they're trying to flatten this curve. They're trying to make sure developers are happy. They're trying to make sure developers, especially in these leading edges, are productive, right? So, so how many of you are, would agree to this, that you're trying to kind of do this at scale in your enterprise? Or it would be a great thing if you could? Quite a few of you, great. So here's the thing. To do that, you need to take a platform-centric approach to the way you're uh, implementing your infrastructure. It's, it's less about thinking about traditional monolithic infrastructure or monolithic product-oriented mindsets. It's not about a product, it's about making sure you have a platform. So that's very key. And it's platform for integration, platform for APIs, platform for compute, storage, network, platform for everything. So, so that's very key. So imagine a platform, what would it look like? It would kind of, you know, what does a stack look like that, that developers need? It looks something like this, where you know, when you're developing, you're gonna need infrastructure, you're gonna need queuing and databases and application frameworks and a connectivity platform, uh, maybe some dev tools and maybe even some APIs, right? So imagine if you could actually take this and make it and, and hear some of the vendors and some of the kind of emerging technologies we see, what if you could actually take this and make this a self-serviceable and, 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 and take a platform approach to this, where you're actually gonna hand it in a platter to somebody? So, so that, who, who, who is trying to do that, by the way? Today, who is trying, who is seeing initiatives or is trying to do this in your enterprise where you're actually making this more self-serviceable? Yeah, good, like about 20%. So here's the thing, right? Imagine you could actually do this in a way that let's say you wanted to select a few things in the platform that you were trying to do. You're trying to like make your development stack, you're trying to like make your application, you need a few things, right? You need this, you need that, you need MuleSoft, you need, you need to create Mule, APIs for Mule, with MuleSoft and the AnyPom platform, and then you need to kind of implement the API, and you need to use also some Java framework and some queuing technology, this and that. Imagine you could actually just ship that over into some very ready, readily available mechanism for you to start developing really quickly. So traditionally, we would kind of have VMs procured, but now what we're seeing emerging is also this, this, this new kind of container technology that's much more application developer friendly and much more actually efficient. And so you know, you'll see containers and, and you know, Docker is, is the blue icon. How many of you have heard of Docker, things like that? Oh wow, how many of you are actually piloting and using Docker in your enterprise? So that's, that's funny, right? So that, I think this is a good leading indicator of where things are going. So this is very relevant for you folks. So you know, if you could do that, that's what, what would make developers really happy, is if you could actually now platformize your stack and provide all of this in a very easily procurable way for a developer in real time, it would actually reduce that, that unhappy curve I just showed you, right? So you go to that world. So, but let's not forget, again, where we're coming from and where we are. It is in this world today, still. We still have to, how many of you still need to fill out request tickets, or how many of you have developers that need to fill out request tickets still? and go through remedy and this kind of, there you go, right? So this is still happening. You'll still have to fill out this process and go through, and you know, funny anecdote, I was, I was having, a, I was meeting a friend of mine, uh, you know, in the Silicon Valley on Friday, and he was saying that, uh, you know, 
five years ago, up to one to five years ago, at least in the Silicon Valley, that is, you know, you'd have AWS, EC2, this and that, S3, you know, that would be the shadow IT infrastructure, right? Where developers would go swipe their credit card and, and start to develop stuff. That was shadow IT. But now what we're seeing uh, is that IT is starting to take that and imbibe that into the process. And so you still need to now fill out a request ticket if you want to get an EC2 instance, which is very ironic. So now the shadow IT is actually moving up the stack to like uh, uh, DigitalOcean. So like DigitalOcean now is a new shadow IT of, of compute apparently. So there's all sorts of interesting kind of ways that you should not do this and you could do this, right? And so how do you actually work and find a good middle ground where you can enable both worlds to, 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 to work, right? So you still have this, this infrastructure, you still have this model, and what does it look like for you to kind of do this well? Because this is, this is a, how many of you see this existing in your enterprise? This picture. How many of you want to get here? Good amount, right? So, so some, of the, some of the key things is, what are the opportunities where you can actually ask and see where your developers are actually using components that are going to be used a lot? It might be things like API designer. It might be things like API implementation. It might be things like compute, storage, things like that. So what are some of, what are the, some of these reusable elements in, in, the, in the infrastructure that you can platformize? What are those candidates? And what are the roadblocks for you to get there? And then how do you make sure you're governing it right, bridging between both worlds, right? So these are some of the key things in your journey you need to take, account, take into account. And what are the, some of the things that are going to prohibit you from adopting a platform at scale? or a platform even in pockets. And so that's, again, I, I guarantee you, it's not a technology answer, it's a, it's a process answer, right? So it's around, all around your operating model. Okay, let's talk about the next uh, aspect, which is very interesting, which is around teams and culture, right? So for those of you that have read, uh, you know, like uh, Lean Enterprise, you know, there's a, a very famous sort of framework they come up with. It's called the OODA framework, the, you know, Observe, Orient, Design, Act. Who, who, who's heard of that? few people. So it's all about, it was pioneered by, you know, a U.S. Air Force uh, um, uh, captain, and, and uh, you know, basically it was all about understanding your enemy. It was like, okay, let's observe the enemy, understand the cultural context, understand how we think they're going to think we act so that you can ambush them, and then you quickly go and ambush them and surprise them, and, you, you know, you, you defeat your enemy. And this led to the development of, like, the F-16 fighter jet and this and that. So why am I telling you this story? It's because now imagine you could actually turn this and actually turn this into, instead of enemies and killing enemies, it's customers delighting customers. So you're all about delighting your customer, and it's the same construct. It's all about observing, understanding who the customer is, getting into their psyche, and then acting and, and ambushing and delighting that customer in a way. So it's the same construct that people are applying. And so for this, we're seeing a very interesting emergence of how teams are getting formed in enterprises. Now, this is a very highly, highly early edge, I'd say for everything I'm covering, but very early kind of edge-centric in your enterprise, where we're starting to see some teams forming that are full-stack teams. And we talked about this already in the morning, you know? Full-stack teams of maybe four to eight people, where you'll actually have from the UI designer all the way down to the database administrator, business logic person, you know, all of them in a single stack, and they're all working in a very product-centric mindset. They're all working in terms of how do I create this product, how do I then maintain this product and take responsibility for this product. So you're actually responsible for the entire life cycle of this product, where a product could be any software, a website, it could be a uh, mobile app, it could be anything. But then, of course, we still have, um, you know, this, this, this other organizational sort of construct, which is more around aligning to systems and infrastructure and, and, and to, to your sort of back-end constructs, right? So... Today, in general, you know, this is what a construct looks like, right? We have products, it's software that are sort of, you know, aligned in some way. Um, and then you'll have a PMO office, then you'll have an architectural function to make sure that, you know, you're governing standards, the PMO is governing, uh, you know, the pipeline of projects, making sure that there's a good business case and, and making sure we're keeping honest to timelines and things like that. And then, then you'll have the technical people below where you'll have UI developers and core developers kind of aligned in some sort of loosely, loose way uh, to, to the projects, uh, products, uh, but predominantly aligned in, in, in a way that's more relevant to the, to the back end and, and to the infrastructure. And then, of course, we'll see the infrastructure uh, resources getting aligned in a much more centralized way, right? So, so how many of you resonate with this model today in your enterprise? Pretty much uh, all of you. And so what we're seeing is emerging 
is actually certain kind of uh, verticalization and, 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 and actually an integration of these teams. What I mentioned was that full stack team. Again, very early days, emerging in pockets. This is like a true startup. This is like every single product is treated as a startup where you'll actually have these full stack teams, you'll have this kind of like, the PMO is playing less of a function in this case actually, it's very ironic. Um, and you know, what, what this yellow band is, is this architect function, that is key. That actually now, for those of you that are uh, EAs, enterprise architects in the room, you know, you're gonna have to figure out how do you, how do you figure out a way to kind of work in both worlds, because that's key. And so this is a very key thing is the redefinition of what your responsibility and the process that you as an enterprise architect are gonna need to institute to kind of accommodate for this kind of a model. Because I'll trust, trust me, the businesses are already working on this. So how many of you in lines of businesses, you know, are actually very consciously or even subconsciously actually working in a, in a team structure like this? See, so it's already happening and you can't avoid it, right? And so, so, so you, you have this world where you have this organizational construct and you have this world, we have this organizational construct. And so some of the key questions to ask yourself is, well, where is this happening, first of all? You know, where is, uh, are we seeing these trends of these stack, stack, full stack teams emerging? And then, you know what, what happens and, and, uh, to, to kind of how we actually bridge between this world and that world? How do we do that? What does the process look like? What does change management look like? What does release management look like? What does the PMO process look like? How do we coexist with both sort of organizational designs. Um, I guarantee you none of you are gonna now call up HR and say, hey HR, we actually now need to create our organization in terms of these full stack teams. Of course not. That is a totally unrealistic uh, proposition that's never gonna happen ever, right? You're all in companies that are big, you're not gonna be able to do this. But the question is, this is happening, and this is happening, it's gonna be happening at scale in some certain business units, especially where you're, you're getting into APIs and microservices, we're already seeing it in a lot of our customers, so the key is how do you actually make this kind of bridge and not ignore it, and, and make sure you optimize your processes for it. So, that this, is, this, is, this is now the culmination of all this is governance process, governance and culture, right? So again, it's all around being able to make sure you're evangelizing, you're empowering, and you're enabling. You're kind of having this notion of, you know, the, like what Uri said, which was like a carrot-based governance. And he said governance was a bad word, and I agree. I don't know what the right word is, but it's not stick-based governance. It's not around centric traditional governance processes and, and, and all that, and enforcing. It's all around this carrot and, and empowering and enabling. So what does that look like, and how can you do that, right? So first of all, let's bring this back to API-led connectivity, and let's look at it in terms of, first of all, as an enterprise architect, for those of you a, that are an enterprise architect in this room, right? We have system APIs, process APIs, experience APIs. Here's a, here's a hypothesis that I've been seeing that I've, I'm, I'm looking to invalidate more and more, but it's actually getting validated more and more, which is basically, as an enterprise architect, right, there's, there's a few functions that I have around APIs and, 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 and integration in general. There is the creation of that API and the creation of that integration asset, then there is making sure, hey, I'm governing this and I'm reusing it, right? Making sure that there's reusability and then making sure that I'm maintaining this and there's standards, security, there's rate limits, throttles, there's all the sort of the right processes and, and technical kind of policies on these assets that I'm creating. So those are the three columns. So what is a role that gonna look like as an enterprise architect and, and what is your jurisdiction gonna be? Well, it's increasingly gonna be, as Uri mentioned, you know, at the lower levels for sure, right? You gotta protect the family jewels of the company but at the higher level, you wanna have a metaphorical fence where you can actually then chuck these APIs over and give it to the business and they can go knock themselves out. And actually they can go and take responsibility for their own destinies and create their own mobile initiatives and create their own stuff. And so the question as an enterprise architect is, how much do you actually wanna throw it over the fence? Do you actually wanna maybe keep it tight and actually have the businesses come to you so that you can actually make sure you're doing the right things in terms of architectural usability and standards or do you actually, actually want to make sure the businesses actually take care of their own destinies and empower them? That's a question, and it's all cultural. It all depends on the organization you're in. But uh, who, who sees this trend emerging as, uh, for those of you that are architects in this room? Right? So this is, this is a key thing that you're going to need to think about. So let's, you know, Star Wars, there was a great, you know, Monday Night Football in, in America. There was a big, uh, big game, you know, Monday nights. It's kind of like the premiership on Saturday. Um, you know, we had a big uh, Star Wars uh, uh, you know, trailer for the, the Force Awakens, 
So I'm going to use a Star Wars theme for the next four slides in honor of that, right? So, so what we see is that the first thing that we see is this ability to internally evangelize in your company, finding folks that are going to be enable, uh, ena enabling mentorship around APIs and enabling sort of uh, periodic uh, informal API events and enabling developers to get up to speed with this kind of thinking around APIs and microservices, et cetera. Right? How many of you actually have someone that's like an internal evangelist in your company? I'm not expecting many. So, so this is a key thing to make sure you're trying, in, trying to invest in. And related to this is this ability to have like what I'm going to call the Jedis. These are the folks that are like, so, so I'm going to call, embarrass somebody. John Phoenix, are you in the room here? Uh, there, there he is. So, so John Phoenix is what I would consider a Jedi for API. Sorry to embarrass you, John. I told you. I warned you. So, so John Phoenix, if you ever want to know what a Jedi looks like and feels like, John Phoenix, that gentleman over there, is, is a Jedi for Barclays, right? So he's basically the guy that is actually, you know, he's an API enthusiast. He evangelizes. He actually takes it upon himself to kind of go out and share best practices and, and make sure people are kind of sharing with each other. And so he's, you know, he, he's one of those guys. So that's very important. It's like a program team. And then, you know, what I would say is, again, I'm giving you some vague constructs here, guys. This is not like a hard and fast rule. I'm giving you some good constructs to work by. And then you have this notion of like labs where you can tinker. Um, you know, it's almost like that startup notion in your company. How many of you have like a lab-like notion where you can actually, you know, uh, have less risk and, uh, you know, uh, assume projects fail fast, succeed even faster? How many of you actually have these kinds of constructs in your company? Am I talking to a blank wall? Okay, good. There are people here. So this is where you actually kind of just go out and kick the tires and actually do things. This is what actually is your leading edge innovation, right? So around APIs, making sure you're doing the same thing. You're enabling this place where people can come in and do this. And then, of course, when you want to make this real, you actually send them to the factory and actually productize them really well and actually, you know, make sure that you're actually doing this the right way. This is now mission critical stuff you want to do for in many cases, making sure you're doing it right, right? So that's key. So, you know, in all this governance, you know, you want to make sure you're actually making sure the right cultural impedance matching is happening, right? You, you want to make sure, and I was very careful here. I didn't put, you know, Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader higher or lower. So I, you know, because some people would say, oh, Darth Vader is down and Luke Skywalker is up. Well, it could be debated that Darth Vader is actually higher and Luke Skywalker is down. So, you know, I don't want to get into that religious debate. But the point here is, right? That the point here is that there are cultural divides, there's, there's, and you've got to figure out what is this good transition period, what are the constructs that you want to start to implement um, and experiment with so that you can actually start to kind of figure this out. So in summary, you know, talking about the operating model, right? We've talked about the business model transformation, but what, what is key here is the operating model transformation. It's realizing that you have a spectrum of emerging practices, a spectrum of emerging technologies, and, and it's a spectrum. It's not, you know, hard and fast, you know, one, two, three, you know, type of practices. So you're going to have to be agile and nimble in the way you think about this. And that's not a tough problem. That's not an easy problem. It's a very tough problem to solve. And so this is where, you know, you're going to need a lot of sort of learning from each other. That's why we're here. Talk to us. We've got to see a lot of this stuff. And so this is all around. That's why Dave Wyatt in the beginning said engage early because we really want to work towards outcomes and we bring these best practices to bear so we can actually help you in this journey. So what do you look like as a company? Are you this? Are you kind of more dominated by the older processes and then you kind of have edges in your company? You know, maybe in, if you're in the in older, more legacy-centric uh, industries, you might look like this. How many of you look like this? Be honest, it's okay, no one judges. See that? Okay, look at that. How many of you actually look like this? I guarantee you 0%, unless you're working like two guys with a dog and a star. Raj, are you serious? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good. So, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so I think, you know, how many, so unless you're two guys and a dog and a startup, you're actually, you, you, you're not going to look like this. But this is great. This is what, you know, Netflix actually did really well at scale, where IT, IT Netflix is literally, you know, hey, I have a problem with my laptop. Can you come fix it? That's all they are. But obviously, that's not the case in all of our companies here. So what are you? I think this is the destination. This is the reality. It's becoming to realize that there's a spectrum of practices, a spectrum of methodologies that you're going to have to incorporate and live with with each other, right? So I'd say most of us are here. We just validated that. This is highly unrealistic. This is the more likely destination. This is where we want to get to. And this is the goal. Now, I wanted to actually complicate your lives even more. Because you know, remember when Uri talked about that, that three-layer cake, the, 
system process, experience APIs. In reality, it actually looks like this in your company, right? You actually have multiple lines of business. You actually have multiple, this could even resemble a single line of business with multiple corridors. This is corridor one, corridor two, corridor three, and then this is behind the photocopier, right? It could actually even be that. But the point is, you're actually gonna have silos of people and groups that actually have their own systems, and each one of them has their own customers, and they're all, uh, they're all little, little independent entities, right? How many of you actually have this? Exactly, right? And so, you know, and, and then you'll also still have this notion of a global backend, so you'll have a global SAP instance, so you'll try to have a global SAP instance. You'll even have a global front end for maybe it's a CFO dashboard or a CIO dashboard or a global customer, you know, dashboard. And the key here is that the reality is that we're actually gonna have this in our enterprise. We're actually gonna have pockets where we're gonna have that's dominant, but this is here, this is here, oh, and then we're gonna have like labs and a bunch of pockets emerging, right? So how many of you actually are seeing this is, this is the reality of your enterprise, right? Different cultures and different lines of businesses. So this is a very hairy problem to solve, and this is what we're seeing every day in our customers, uh, and, and they're trying to grapple with, right? So I think I've scared you guys enough. You know, it's not all doom and gloom. Everyone's in the same boat here, but I think we should all talk to each other, learn from each other. The point of this presentation is it's a journey, and we just gotta make sure we're aware of the realities, but also be aware of where things are going and figure out how we can actually bridge to that. And so I'd leave you with some questions, things to think about, right? You know, just have a, have a, read, of this, have a read of this, but it's basically where can we be more agile? Where can we bridge between requirements and agile type gathering, uh, agile requirement gathering between the old and the new? How can we kind of bridge between those two worlds? Where can we speed up and, and see where commonly used infrastructure components can be actually more democratizable and, and put more as a platform? So stop thinking about in terms of product, but think about platform. And then, you know, how do we actually modernize ourselves around team and culture makeups, right? So we have to acknowledge that and be real, and we're not gonna all be, you know, small little startup oriented teams, but that is happening, and so how do we actually work with that construct? And then around governance, how do we make sure we're enabling ourselves for a, for a good, API building block program, and then how do I exist with my existing processes and make sure that that governance is, is, is matching with the governance that, that gets uh, uh, existing over here. And so, so these are the key things I'd like you to think about. There's a lot of information here, but it's all about a journey, it's all about an operating model. It's all about redefining where you're gonna look like, how you're gonna look like. So, so with that, I think uh, uh, hopefully you found this informative. Um, and you know, again, I urge you to share with each other. Um, there is no single expert in this room. What we bring at MuleSoft is the education from talking to many of you, and so we're like a point of aggregation, and we actually see what folks are doing, what folks are not doing, what, what could be good, what could not be good. And so I think definitely leverage us, find us in the hallways, and, and definitely bring up these type of topics in your, in your engagements with, with everybody. Okay, thank you. <laughs>